If you're a 5 that this might pertain to, where you feel like you're having a tough time taking dinks out of the air, get out there and drill it. Because taking dinks out of the air and just dinking them back. I'm not saying that you have to be taking dinks out of the air and speeding up every single one of them, but taking dinks out of the air and just shrinking the kitchen line, taking their time away, making them do something else is a hugely valuable skill. So for me, I'm always leaning in. I'm always leaning in. I'm always trying to take dinks out of the air if I can, because it also makes it way easier for me to speed up out of the air when I do see that it's a little bit high, so. Okay, so we are back with another episode of the James Ignatowicz podcast, um, and one of the questions that I have been asked a lot, see, we're just, we're just diving right into it these days. We're not even, you know, it's been probably six seconds, and my first statement is, one of the questions I've been asked, there's no more downtime, well, actually, I guess now there is downtime because of the last 20 seconds of me talking about how there's no downtime. So, um, yeah, we're working on it here, guys. We're, we're trying to get, uh, get professional here. But um, anyways, one of the questions that I've been asked more often than anything at these clinics is, how do the top pros train? How do we drill? And this is specifically as it relates to on-court practicing. So not the off-court stuff. We're going to get into that into the next podcast probably sounds like a pretty good idea. Right now, we're just going to talk about how the pros train and Ultimately, what are they doing differently from players who are not doing as well? Maybe what separates the top 10 players and how they practice versus guys that are, you know, 30, 40 and just trying to figure it out and maybe not having the same results. And I've been exposed to a wide array of practicing. I've had the opportunity to see how pretty much everybody practices. I think that's one of the coolest things for me, just, you know, playing with all these different players, going to the tournaments, getting to play rec with people who are just, you know, whether it's Ben Johns or it's just been awesome. That's actually one of my favorite things about playing tournaments is the rec play beforehand. I think actually at MLP, it's the best. You know, you've got these cool matchups, right? Like you've got, you know, Ben and Eric and Riley and Christian and just kind of different teams that you wouldn't necessarily see. And then you play rec against them. And I've had a ton of fun doing that. So for me, I think one of the things I've noticed um, when it's just drilling or even if it's rec play the guys that are really, really, really good, it doesn't really seem like they take any points off. You know, they're not really taking rallies off or points off. And, and what I mean by taking it off is not giving their best effort in one point and then giving better effort in another point or rally. And that's something that I've tried to do my best to implement when I practice because it's easy to kind of play four or five good points and then take one or two points off and then four or five good ones and then start to think about something else. And I think it's pretty natural for the human mind to want to think about other things and, and kind of drift in and out of focus. And I know that I do that all the time. And it's, it's funny because how you train and how you practice is evidently going to be how you play matches. Uh, I would imagine that it's almost impossible to practice one way every single time and then go out there and play a match and be different and somehow play your best. It's not really how it works. You know, really you have to practice the way that you train or the way that you would then play a match. So for me, I think what the top pros do, and I would maybe hopefully include myself in that category as a top pro, is you know, for me, every time I drill, I am taking it very seriously and I'm treating it like I would a match. Like every single time I play points or even if I'm just dinking back and forth, there's been other pros who have been practicing with me and whether it's at the tournament or, or even just at home in Boca and they're saying like, dang, you put a lot of effort into dinking and a lot of effort into just, you know, casual cross court dinking, dropping, whatever it is. I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of my job. Right, it, it's it's the reason that you're watching me today. It's been a pretty big part of my life. So I do take it really seriously. And I think that that is something that separates the best players from players who are maybe still very talented, but not having the same type of results. It's that consistency in practice because consistency in practice will lend itself to consistency in matches. You can't have consistency in practice and, or sorry, inconsistency in practice and then try to play matches 
and just be some rock of discipline and consistency. Um, if you can, that's amazing, but I, I really haven't seen that too much. So for me, when I drill, regardless of who it's with or where I am, I am always fully engaged. So I'm not really thinking much at all, and I think I'm lucky to be at the point where I don't have to think much because I've practiced so much and I already know the right shots for me and I know my game and I'm comfortable with it. So I am fully engaged, whether it's you know dropping or dinking, and I think that's a big part of it. And it's, you know, it's not always gonna be fun. I think one of the easiest ways to stay engaged in something is if you are having a lot of fun doing it. And we all know that, but what's tricky is being engaged in something that isn't necessarily fun. Like you're dinking back and forth with somebody for the sixth time this week, right? Six days in a row, and there's nothing new or necessarily exciting about it, but you have to be fully engaged. And it's, it's tough, and I think that is one of the reasons why there aren't too many top pros. Like it's, it is a select few people that are able to always be that focused and always take it that seriously. But the mental side of it is often overlooked, but very important. And when people think of the mental side of pickleball, I actually saw this on, on a Facebook group, like this, this thread about the mental side of pickleball and how the top players are mentally better and they're smarter players and, and they're just, you know, they're playing chess. Um, maybe, I, I don't really think that the mental side of pickleball is actually as much of a, you know, those, those top players are smarter and able to think more deeply about pickleball. I mean, maybe a little, but I don't really think that's what it is. I think what's going on when people say that the top players are sort of better mentally is actually just they're able to be more present for longer periods of time. So they're able to focus more deeply and be more engaged for more long periods of time. There's not an up and down, you know, very focused sometimes, not focused other times. I think that's the mental side of pickleball, and it, it is extremely important, but it's not, it's not some chess match. I mean, pickleball ultimately is a pretty simple game. You don't have to be a genius to be an amazing pickleball player. It is a game where it requires some strategy for sure, and there is some nuance, but it's not rocket science. And the mental side of pickleball, which is very important, I think the importance there is the discipline and the just staying engaged, staying in the moment, and actually a lot of it is the absence of thought, the abs being able to not think about other things or think too much or get you know, lulled into the trash talking and thinking this and that. Really, it's just staying focused. And if actually, if the trash talking helps you focus, then it helps you focus. But what I'm saying here is that it's just about staying engaged and being in the present when you play and that starts with drilling. Because if you are drilling and you're practicing and training and you're thinking about going to Starbucks, which I was today uh, a little bit, I, was, I missed a reset because I was, I was literally, I was thinking about what I wanted to get from Starbucks later and it just, that can't happen. So I, I, you know, I had to do a little mental reset right away. And this is actually a true story. It sounds like I'm trying to be funny. Um, I suppose it's kind of funny, but you know, that's the type of stuff. If you have to be focused in practice to then be focused in matches because practice and matches are the same in the sense that it's pickleball. You're, you're out there on a pickleball court and you need to be conditioning yourself to treat pickleball every time like it is a engaged, focused process and that's how you get better. You don't get better just kind of messing around. Um, that doesn't mean you can't have fun. You can have fun, but you have to be engaged and that's how you get better. So I would say that was one of the things I noticed, probably the biggest difference in how the pros train. And I think um, one thing that you'll notice with the top players, I think there is more intensity uh, with the feet. And I think there's actually cleaner strokes with the top players. I think that the top of the top are very clean and simple with their technique. And I do think they're a little more intense with the feet. Um, obviously, I'm going to be the one that's saying that because I'm the most intense guy with the feet. And if you look at a guy like Ben Johns, he actually does have good footwork, and people say, oh, it doesn't really look like he moves his feet. Well, he's really efficient with his footwork, and I wish I could be that efficient. It just doesn't really work for me, but he is moving his feet well, and I think that if you look at guys like Riley or Christian or Tyson, there's a lot of intensity in the feet, and one of the things you might notice as you go down in level, even to just like a high 5-0, 
they have a little bit more funk in the technique. I think that the top pros are very clean with their technique. Usually it's smaller swings. So very small swings, there's not that much that can go wrong. I think that the more funk that there is, the more wrist action, and, and generally just the larger swing that there is, I think that that lends itself to some errors. I think that there's just less margin for error if there's more things that are going on when you hit the shot. So um, that's another thing that I think separates the top pro, top pros from others. And another thing, I mean, I, I'm just, this is just coming to my mind here, but people don't really realize I'm pretty new to this pro pickleball. You know, I've really only been a high level pro for about a year and a half. And I just had a notification on my phone that two years ago today, I had just lost in the finals of my men's four or five doubles, uh, which is pretty interesting. And when I look back and it's like, actually, yeah, it wasn't too long ago where I was still grinding the four or five and the five oh and, and trying to figure out how to get good. Not that four or fives and five oh's aren't good, but how to get really good, I suppose. And I remember it very vividly, like one of the things that changes so much when you go from 5.0 to pro is how much space you have to dink into and how much space you have to make dinks bounce. Because for me, when I was playing 5.0, I've always loved the two-handed cross court, aggressive dink, and I can do it with pros. I mean, you've seen me, I'm hitting my two-handed backhand roll, but I've had to shorten it up a lot in the court, making it bounce maybe six inches before the kitchen line now. And when I was playing 5.0s, I felt like I had just invented this two-handed cross-court backhand dink that I could make bounce you know, six inches past the kitchen and I could really just control the kitchen line because guys at the 5.0 level aren't taking as many dinks out of the air. They're not super comfortable with leaning to one side, leaning to the other side and really just shrinking that kitchen and taking a ton of balls out of the air, making it really tough for other people to control the kitchen line. And the pros do that really well. I think that, along with the transition game, is the thing that changes the most between 5-0s and pros. Because when I, you know, sometimes I'll play with 5-0s and we'll do clinics and we'll kind of do fun little games. And I feel like I've got an ocean to dink into. And it's not because 5-0s are like shorter and they have less of a wingspan. I think what it is, is they're just less comfortable taking dinks out of the air. And with the pros, especially the top ones, I feel like if I don't make that dink bounce in men's doubles six inches before the kitchen line, they're gonna take it out of the air and potentially attack it, or at the very least just dink it out of the air and take my time away. So ultimately, I feel like the 5-0s are just not taking as many dinks out of the air, they're not shrinking the kitchen like the pros are, and that's something that really matters because if you are able to, you know, I would say this, if I'm able to make dinks bounce on the kitchen line consistently, consistently against a male, you know, a men's team, that's probably not good. I really feel like I can control the kitchen line a lot more in those situations. But if I can't, and I'm playing against a team like Dylan and JW, where anything that they can remotely take out of the air and attack, they will, that shrinks the kitchen it makes it almost impossible for me to set up a lot of the patterns that I like to set up and it just changes the entire game. So that would be one thing that I would recommend right away that I keep seeing over and over. If you're a 5-0, get better or, you know, I mean, not all 5-0s, right? But if, if you're a 5-0 that this might pertain to where you feel like you're having a tough time taking dinks out of the air, get out there and drill it because taking dinks out of the air and just dinking them back I'm not saying that you have to be taking dinks out of the air and, and speeding up every single one of them, but taking dinks out of the air and just shrinking the kitchen line, taking their time away, making them do something else is a hugely valuable skill. So for me, I'm always leaning in. I'm always leaning in. I'm always trying to take dinks out of the air if I can, because it also makes it way easier for me to speed up out of the air when I do see that it's a little bit high. So high five O's, lean in take dinks out of the air, shrink the kitchen line, because ultimately in men's doubles, out of the air attacks are better than off the bounce attacks anyway, I found at least. I've had a lot more success, and I love speeding up off the bounce, but I think statistically, and I've gone back and I've done some of the stats in my matches, the you know speed ups that are from out of the air, I'm pretty sure there's a higher chance of those succeeding than off the bounce attacks. That doesn't mean there's no place for off the bounce attacks, 
but speeding up out of the air is always going to be my first choice. And I think it should be most people's first choice. I mean, you're closer to the other person, so you can take more of their time away. It might be easier to get a downward trajectory on the ball because you can make contact at a higher point with one with a ball that's out of the air than one that's off the bounce. There's a ton of reasons for that. We might have to get to that in the next episode, but we're just going to leave it at this. If you're looking to get better and better and better, especially if you're already pretty good at dinking, get better at taking dinks out of the air because you might not notice it, but you're taking your other person's time away. You're making it harder for your other, for your opponent. And that's the main thing. So we're just going to leave it at that. I'm going to get some food. Thank you very much. Thank you.